Um, great. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, thank you so much to everybody for joining us for today's session about uh, Spotlight on Volunteering, where we're looking um, at the European Solidarity Corps and the opportunities for volunteering involving organisations. So um, just a very quick overview of our agenda for this morning. We've got, uh, we're very lucky to have a, a short message from Minister of State Joe O'Brien, TD, um, who was involved um, and, and pioneered the, the, um, your, the volunteering strategy for Ireland. Um, and I'll play that for everybody now in a moment. Um, and then we're going to have a short overview of the European Solidarity Corps from uh, Suzanne from Lergus, um, who's the expert on it there, and will just give us a little bit of an introduction into what it all means before we head into our panel discussion, where we have three different panelists to um, talk about their experiences with the European Solidarity Corps and, and answer any questions that people might have. Um, after that, that'll bring us um, up to the hours, so it'll bring us up to 11. Um, and then we'll have a short kind of 10 minute coffee break where you can just stretch your legs and get a bit of fresh air um, before we head into a training. So the idea is that hopefully having been introduced to the European Solidarity Corps or learning more about it, if you're already familiar with it, and hopefully being inspired by some of the great success stories and experiences that our panelists have had, if that's uh, of interest to you and you're thinking, you know, how can my organization benefit from this? Uh, you'll be able to get that information in the training session afterwards, um, which will be uh, delivered by Nolene from Lergus. So um, with that, we are going to um, just head into the video for uh, from Minister Joe O'Brien. Um, just to note that our CEO, Deirdre, was supposed to have been here today, so he references her. But unfortunately, she couldn't make it. But um, I'll go ahead and play the video now. Um, and just let me know if you if there's any problems with sound or anything like that. Thank you, Deirdre. It's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to you all today and to be invited as your guest of honour. I've never been listed as a guest of honour before, so thank you for the title. If it happens more often, I'll start getting notions about myself. Seriously, mm -hmm. though, I am eager to take uh, whatever opportunity I can to thank the community and voluntary sector for your efforts. And I'd like to thank you all for your invaluable work in what has been an unprecedented year and a half for us all. Events like this help us recognise and remember so much of what is positive about volunteering, it provides an opportunity to consider and to acknowledge the enormous contribution of volunteering to Irish society and indeed internationally. I would like to thank you all for your work in developing and growing volunteering in Ireland and your continuing contribution to overseas volunteering. The last two years has certainly presented many challenges, but it has also shone a light on the sheer necessity of volunteering and the work that volunteers do in communities. Since COVID-19 came to Ireland, my department has played a central role in the nation's response to it, through the community call, through participation on the National Oversight Committee, and providing funding and support for many elements of the community response. In 2020 alone, over 26,000 volunteers registered through the iVol app, and these volunteers were directly linked by the network of volunteer centres to organisations responding to the pandemic. These figures do not include the volunteers who are already making a difference in our communities, who just show up and do so much work on the ground, helping out their family, friends, neighbours, often working tirelessly on behalf of their community. So much volunteering goes unregistered or seemingly unnoticed, but no act of generosity goes unnoticed by those who are in need of support. However, domestic volunteering successes notwithstanding, it is important to remember that throughout the pandemic, international volunteering has taken a backseat in terms of workability and person power. Although COVID-19 restrictions meant we were not in a position to assist in many overseas projects, this temporary hiatus enables us to regroup and plan effectively to ensure maximum efficacy in future endeavours. I have a particular interest in international volunteering. Uh, earlier in life, I spent many hours poring over the options for international volunteering, and some of my richest and most influential experiences have been through international volunteering at the Sydney 2000 Paralympics, uh, in Tanzania at a Maasai Women's Project, and I worked as a human rights observer in the West Bank. I was also close to joining the UN Volunteer Programme in Kosovo, but chose a different path here in Ireland. And to this day, uh, I'm on uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs Register for election observation. So I'm particularly happy to promote the value of international volunteering. As safe travel becomes possible, willing aides will once again have the opportunity to learn and share skills, gain new and exciting experiences, and make a difference whether through volunteering, training or working. 
This is such an important element of Ireland's contribution to global citizenship as we share our time and skills across the globe. I couldn't appear here today and not mention our national volunteering strategy and to acknowledge your continued contribution to its implementation even in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis. The strategy is an acknowledgement by government of how important volunteering is to the well-being of the nation and it helps us all to support the delivery of an agreed and ambitious vision. Through the implementation of this strategy, we will have greater awareness of volunteering to increase visibility and recognition, stronger structures for volunteers and organisations, and we will develop greater diversity in volunteering opportunities and volunteers themselves. In collaboration with our colleagues in the Department of Foreign Affairs and through the work of the implementation group, we will pursue ethical international volunteering and its promotion, support and monitoring. While the volunteering strategy sets out our vision and statement of intent, it will not be possible without the selfless, enthusiastic and generous dedication of each and every volunteer who actually make volunteering a reality. The strategic objectives, alignment with the UN's Sustainable Development Goals ensures that our volunteering targets are to the greater good locally and globally. I can assure you of the government's continuing support for your work in developing volunteering for the benefit of all and in particular I would like to reiterate my own personal confidence in the ability, creativity and energy that exists in the sector. Thank you. So um, a lovely message there from uh, Minister O'Brien um, about the value of volunteering both in Ireland and, and around the world um, and its place in, in Irish society. Um, so uh, just from that now we're going to hand over uh, to Suzanne Kavanagh, who is a Senior Support and Development, o Development Officer at Lergus in charge of the European Solidarity Corps, who's going to give us a little bit of an overview of what role Euro the European Solidarity Corps can play um, in relation to kind of volunteering in Ireland. So uh, Suzanne, over to you when you're ready. Thanks Emma. Um, good morning everybody. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, in our six minutes. So yeah, good morning from Lergus. Well, not we're also working from home. Um, and uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Um, yeah, as Emma said, I'm Suzanne Kavanagh and uh, I work with my colleague Nolene, who's here with us as well today. She's going to do the, um, the training uh, after this um, on the European Solidarity Corps. Um, the European Solidarity Corps comes from a programme called the European Voluntary Service um, that ran for 25 years and it has developed um, over those years to have a robust and um, I suppose a good framework around uh, supporting volunteers traveling across Europe. So I'm just going to give you a little overview now. So this new program then will run from 21 to 27. So uh, the Solidarity Corps was launched in 2016 and that ran to 2020. So it's a new program and this contributes to the EU priorities of more inclusive and digitally safe society, a greener Europe, a health recovery from COVID-19 with civically engaged young people. So the European Solidarity Corps supports organizations working in inclusion, citizenship and democratic participation, disaster prevention and recovery, environment and natural protection, health and well-being, education and training, reception and integration of refugees and migrants and, and much more. So the idea is that it's a very flexible program. It's about uh, organizations who are working on the ground who are recognizing a local need, they uh, address that need in their community. And the solidarity piece is where young people come to those organizations, they help uh, to uh, increase the outreach, they might uh, take on different um, activities within the organization and within the community to help address those, uh, those issues. They then develop their own empathy. So they develop an understanding and um, a recognition of all of the, uh, of how to address those issues and how to do it in a way that's um, appropriate. And then the, the idea is then the young person returns back to their own country with this developed empathy and then become an active citizen. So they recognize their uh, responsibility in addressing those issues. So this is how the programme looks. Um, it's actually an umbrella term. So there's uh, the European Solidarity Corps and out of that then comes two actions. The centralised actions are uh, the actions in um, that to apply for in Brussels. Uh, for organisations who want to participate in the European Solidarity Corps, they have to have a quality label. So that is to ensure that there's an, 
like I said, the appropriate framework. So the conditions um, to support volunteers are there, that organisations provide that. Um, and then in the centralised actions, then there's volunteering in high priority areas. So those projects actually have been ring fenced around the recovery from COVID-19. So there's grants there. And then in 2022, um, the humanitarian aid related solidarity activities, which is a bit of a mouthful, uh, will begin. And that is the, uh, that the EU aid volunteers will come under the Solidarity Corps uh, programme. Uh, and then for the decentralised action, so that's us, the national agency. So Lurgus is the national agency um, responsible for the implementation of the Solidarity Corps in Southern Ireland. Um, we uh, manage the programme, we um, implement the programme, uh, we manage obviously the grants, um, and for organisations who want to participate um, uh, and want, want to apply to the national agency, again, they must have a quality label. Um, so that is the entry point into the programme. And then uh, out of that, then they, enter, they can apply for uh, grants under the volunteering strand. There's also solidarity projects for anybody who works for, with young people, 18 to 30. They apply um, to us for a grant directly. They don't need a quality label. Um, for projects up to a year, five young people um, who, who see a need in their locality and want to address it. Um, and I'm sure Noli will be talking to you about them a little bit more. So then the European Solidarity Corps, uh, for the grant application process, the first step then is, like I said, the quality label. So this is the entry point in. Uh, it's through a single point. So this, this is the only way in. Um, all organisations wishing to take part in the programme must hold a quality label. So if you have a quality label and you have a partner that doesn't have a quality label, they need a quality label too. So you have a host organisation, a sending organisation, and then you uh, they both have to have a quality label. In, for the quality label, uh, organisations must be legally, legally established in the programme country for one year. The requirements to obtain the quality label vary depending on the type of quality label you request. So like I said, there's a framework um, around how to support those volunteers. So if you're the host, you have certain responsibilities. If you're the support or the send organisation, you also have a set, a set of responsibilities. And, and that um, application will be um, assessed according to those how you meet that criteria. The applications for the quality label can be submitted on a continuous basis, basis so there's no deadline. So what are the benefits to organizations? So the organizations, they have access to uh, committed and motivated young people. So what happens is young people register for the Solidarity Corps themselves, and um, they um, outline what they're interested in, um, where they'd like to go, when they're available, what their skills are, um, and how the, and, you know, what motivates them. At the moment, there's over 250,000 young people uh, signed up for the Solidarity Corps, and I call it the Tinder of the Solidarity Corps. So according to that criteria, they're matched against what you need or what you're doing in your organization and how, that, and how they, they might match uh, with your volunteers. Then, uh, once awarded the quality label, you have access to a simplified funding process. So once you have the quality label, there are, uh, in 2022, there are two uh, funding deadlines in February and October. And this, those forms are very, very simple, uh, take about 10 minutes to fill in, very different from um, uh, a lot of other funding applications I'm sure you, uh, you've um, put in. So, the, once the quality label done, is done, then you have that, that, and you have that then until the end of the program, which is 2027. You also have the high support from Lurgis, so we take a high support approach. So uh, we walk you through the process. We have uh, lots of different trainings at lots of different levels, and um, so we can do one to ones. We also have information sessions, discovery days, um, and also then thematic trainings uh, that are specific to the program to say some of the. Priorities like inclusion, digitalization, um, um, and greener practices and stuff like that. So um, there's lots of support from Lurgus. And we also have international trainings where you then can have partner finding um, seminars where you uh, can meet like-minded organizations and you develop your own project during that training um, according to that team. So there's lots of different uh, ways that we support you. And then uh, there's also the direct link to the National Volunteering Strategy that the minister talked about there. So the Solidarity Corps is, has a specific mention in the strategy under objective four. 
So um, you have then that direct, direct link to that strategy, which um, supports your organization in uh, lots of ways in terms of you know, being able to um, advocate on behalf of your organization and to link what you're doing directly to strategy, which then is linked directly to policy at both uh, Irish uh, national level and also European level. So what are the volunteering projects? So these are for 18 to 30 year olds. Um, there's two types of activities. You can have individuals come into your organization or you can have a team of up to 40 volunteers. They can stay with you for two months to 12 months for an individual or for a team for two weeks to two months. And then they can be in country. Uh, so you can have Irish volunteers volunteering in Irish organizations. And you can also have cross border um, for individuals. And so that's the international volunteers coming um, and they can also be part of a team with Irish volunteers, which is a great exchange as well. So these are the budget categories. Uh, you can, uh, you have travel, organization support, inclusion support and pocket money. These are all unit costs. Um, so they're, um, they're provided to you and then you uh, manage that. We don't look for the receipts and stuff like that. Um, and then there's also support around uh, linguistic support. So it helps with the language. Um, they also get a top-up insurance uh, for anybody that has the European Health Insurance Card, or if they don't have the European Health Insurance Card, they also get covered with the insurance, and it's very good insurance. And there's also exceptional costs, so if there's any barriers for participation um, for young people, then they can apply for exceptional costs, so things like passports, um, suitcases, if they need specific clothing for different types of weather, different types of activities, you can apply for that as well. So there's lots of uh, support for uh, what we call young people with, their, with fewer opportunities. So is there any questions? Thank you, Suzanne. Um, we will have time as well at the, at the end for any questions um, when, once the training has been done as well, of course, we can get a bit of a deeper dive. Um, but uh, yeah, and if there are any questions throughout, we are going to be moving on to our panel discussion now soon. So and Suzanne will be on our panel. So if there yeah. are any questions that Suzanne can answer, if you want to have a think about it, um, please do and just pop them in the chat box and my colleagues will alert me to them. Um, but thanks a million for that, Suzanne. It's yeah, really that was a whistle stop to her. So <laughs> I know that. But it's yeah, no, it's, we'll go into more details afterwards. Anyway. Absolutely, exactly. No, it's a really good overview just to give people a bit of context. Um, and it certainly seems like just looking at it there, it certainly seems that if you're involved with volunteering, it's kind of a no brainer to at least apply for that quality label. It's certainly, you know, it'll be a good worthwhile investment um, and a good first step into the program. And there's just so much support there. And I think, you know, as somebody who's involved a lot in European programs, they've made a real effort for it to be as accessible as possible. It's a very, um, you know, I don't want to say easy, but <laughs> simplified application process. Um, and and even just, you know, the, the real thought has gone into obviously making it as inclusive as possible and, and, and everything. So um, hopefully at, at, at least people today, if, they're, if they do nothing else, they'll be inspired to go and get their quality label. Because I think it's a really excellent thing to do as a volunteering organization anyway. Um, so um, with that, as I said, we're going to keep Suzanne on our panel um, in case any technical questions come up that we need to we need answered. Um, but we are going to kind of move on to our other panelists here just to get some kind of insights and experience of the European Solidarity Corps and some perspective on um, uh, volunteering in Ireland in general. So I have three panelists here um, I'm going to introduce each of them um, and I'll ask you just to unmute yourselves and we'll have a short chat. Um, but if anybody has any questions, as I said, for our panelists or for Suzanne throughout uh, coming up until 11 o'clock, we can um, we'll be happy to take questions and, and I can put them to them. I'm just going to keep an eye on my little chat box here on my phone to see if anybody uh, sends anything in. So uh, with that, I want to introduce my panelists. So our, my first panelist is Vicky O'Connell. She is the uh, Learning and Capacity Building Officer with Volunteer Ireland. Uh, she also has a background in European projects. And having worked on various um, Erasmus projects with partners across Europe. So, um, uh, Vicky, do you want to just say hi there? And uh, hi. <laughs> Thank you very yeah, much. I, I think I'm on mute today. Good morning. How is everybody? So it's um, yeah, pleased to be here. And uh, yeah, it's very interesting listening and hearing more about uh, European Solidarity Corps. Great. Thank you very much for joining us, Vicky. 
Um, so we'll come back and ask everybody questions, but I'll introduce my other my other panelists. So uh, we have Amy Collins, who is a youth worker in Dublin's inner city. Um, she has a really extraordinary story and connection with the European Solidarity Corps. Uh, she left school early, having struggled in the school environment and was told she would be very limited in her future op options because of this. But meeting a youth worker who introduced her to the European Solidarity Corps really changed her life. She took part in a Solidarity Corps project in rural Moldova and then in North Macedonia and went on to complete a degree in community work and youth work and later a master's degree in rights and social policy. And she credits her volunteering experience as, as being a key driver in that person development um, and has been the youth worker accompanying groups on their European Solidarity Corps experience now. So very much kind of paying it forward um, and supporting others to benefit in, in the way that she has. So Amy, you're very welcome if you want to say hi to everybody today. Sorry, that person sounded amazing. I can't believe that was my little story. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm Amy, so I'll be chatting away to you. And actually, it's really nice. I think there's some people here that were with me when I became that youth worker in Greece. So that's Great. fantastic. Amy. Oh, that's wonderful. Great. Your, your cheerleaders here uh, for the morning. So that's great. And then our final panelist we have is uh, Stefania Marzia uh, is the Development Officer and Volunteer Coordinator in Kings River Community, an organization committed to inclusion and equal opportunities for people with different abilities. Um, so she was chosen to take part in a European Voluntary Service uh, project in 2002 and says that she hasn't looked back since. Uh, since then, Stefania has um, obtained an honours degree in uh, applied social so uh, studies in uh, in social care and has been Kings Rivers Kings Rivers volunteer mentor coordinator supervisor and project manager. So Stefania, do you want to say hi? Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us to everybody. Um, yeah, no worries. We're we're delighted to have everybody here. Um, so yeah, I had uh, I just wanted to maybe start with you, Vicky. Um, first, so from a you know volunteer Ireland are obviously. The National Volunteer Development Organization in Ireland and so they're very deeply connected with all things volunteering and trends in volunteering and policy and, and what the needs are and what the opportunities are. So from your perspective, what are the big um, changes that volunteer involving organizations are facing and I suppose how can groups keep up and, and what can a program like the European Solidarity Corps do to help? Oh, okay. So, well, That's first of all, <laughs> a lot in it. So, um, first of all, then the the changes that are happening. Um, I suppose we saw changes happening before March 2020, before COVID, um, which were people were looking for more episodic or short term volunteering roles, even micro volunteering, um, and also there was a, a shift towards online and virtual volunteering, um, and this was like pre COVID. Um, since COVID, of course, there has been a, a massive shift to online volunteering um, and also, uh, again, the short term. Um, we have research uh, completed by an organisation called Ipsos, and we're also actually in the process of coming to the end of research with DCU, which has shown these, these shifts and also a shift towards informal volunteering as well. So where before people would register with the big organisations um, and, and go towards volunteering that way through COVID there just wasn't enough volunteer roles for people to do so people did the informal volunteering and there seems to be a, a, a shift towards this as well so organizations then need to keep up with these changes um, they need to accept the changes and instead of having their role which was three hours a week for 18 months and that was it you know they need to have a look at how they can maybe break that role up into shorter roles um, so, uh, smaller roles and smaller time and a less of a commitment because um, that seems to be what uh, what people want to volunteer that's how they want to volunteer um, and that research as well it also showed that um, more people are, are hoping to volunteer post-covid than they did pre-covid so there's going to be a bigger impact on the number of people that are volunteering um, but they will be volunteering for shorter periods of time um, as they go about it. So, as we say, the organisations need to change to, to um, match what the volunteers want. And so we're all in this together now more than ever, you know, whether it's through Europe or even internationally, everybody's experiencing the same. And the best way to change is just to talk to other people, just to network and to, to see how others are changing um, and, and to learn from other people, learn from your fellow volunteer managers through the volunteer centres or Volunteer Ireland, or indeed, the 
European Solidarity Corps because through the um, European Solidarity Corps, you, you know, networks are formed and there, there is a lot of um, uh, peer to peer support. There's a massive support through through the organization themselves as well. But yeah, they, they, you, you have the, that network of support worldwide um, through, throughout um, Europe. So yeah, definitely that's one of the, uh, the benefits of, uh, of the European, European Solidarity Corps for the, for the changing roles of the uh, volunteers. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really interesting that I think it's, it's uh, across life, I think people are looking for more flexibility and more, um, you know, it, it's just even with our, all of us working from home and things like that and we were actually just having a conversation about whether people will be going back to the office and everything and everybody kind of wants their own kind of customizable thing so it's interesting to see that that's reflected in volunteering as well absolutely yeah. um, and that organizations do have to you know offer the opportunities that people that is is uh, realistic for people and that people can engage in um, and I suppose, do you think then that something like the European style, like, you know, as much as that's great and you do have to reflect what people want to need, and, and it's fantastic to hear that more people want to volunteer, they just want it to be a bit more flexible. Um, could something like the Europe, European Solidarity Corps then that, that offers kind of long term, uh, you know, sustained volunteering where you get a volunteer for a designated amount of time and, uh, you know, you have them almost full time for, for a while, like, is that... Could that kind of help bridge the gap between you know the flexible volunteers and then being able to have a more consistent volunteering yeah absolutely like the the organizations also you know will have particular projects that they want to to continue with um and and this is where the european solidarity course will come in you know volu um, organizations at the moment have been able to um access i suppose until now like you know the pools of volunteers with um, with the specific skills or perspectives attributes that they need for their for their projects or, or not even necessarily even being able to access them but maybe being able to support them and fund them and cover the costs of coordinating them within their project and that you know it's these long-term projects i suppose that the european solidarity corps will, will uh, support um, so that yeah, organisations do need the the project um, in order to get those good quality, effective volunteers for their longer, long long term projects. Um, and as you said as well, like you know the quality label, and there's just such a huge scope as well and uh, variety that it's just uh, yeah. it's very beneficial for for the organisations as well. Like it just basically the you know it helps your your organisation to be able to do more because um, they can focus on the bigger picture at the same time as being able to be flexible for other volunteers. Yeah. And I suppose, yeah, for, from, an, from a Volunteer Ireland perspective, even the process of doing that quality label, I suppose it's a good way of standardising and ensuring Absolutely. that your organisation is adhering to best practice on an That's international it, exactly. Level. And it's recognised as well. People that, that will yeah. know that you have that quality label and realise that you that you provide a good quality volunteer experience and that you're committed to the specific values as well of um, European Solidarity Corps. Great. Absolutely. Thanks, Vicky. Um, I might move on to Amy because we kind of talked about there a little bit, uh, you know, the, the benefits that are in it for volunteers. You know, you have access to a continuous um, pool of volunteers that are there on a kind of long term basis with you to kind of help counteract the more flexible volunteer that, you know, maybe your more traditional pool of volunteers are, are expecting now. Um, it's skilled volunteering. It's about quality. It's about adhering to standards, all that kind of thing from an organizational perspective. But Amy, for you, from a from a more personal participant perspective, like hearing your story there, it's really just extraordinary. Um, and it just goes to show, I suppose, the impact these kinds of projects can have um, on, on an individual. Um, so maybe you can tell me, if, if, you, if you don't mind telling me a little bit more about that kind of impact that it's had on you. And um, even beyond, like, you know, that it was just a great experience, I suppose, the value that it offered and, and what's, like, unique or special about it. Well, I think the most important thing to start off with is that when I went on my very first one that I never realized it was going to have such an impact um, as having left school early um, and I suppose now falling into what I now know as the definition of that type of young person that Suzanne talked about um, you know I end up coming out of the project with the objectives that the program would hope to have but that's not how I saw it at the very beginning um, I left school I knew I wanted to do something, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do. A youth worker kind of, you know, had said to me, oh, I know this 
youth worker who sends people abroad and you know to be honest my family we didn't afford to leave Ireland for holidays or anything so I was like oh my god all of my friends that finished school were going volunteering and they were being paid to do that and you know they were able to do these things and then for her to come around and say oh you could do this thing and I everyone always laughs when I tell a story because she says to me well I have an opening in two weeks and it's in Moldova and I says yeah I'll go where's Moldova and she was like, and I always laugh because I knew it was in the Eurovision and I knew <laughs> you probably heard me say that. But I was just like, yeah, okay. And then I was like, oh no, I actually can't do that. Like people like me just don't do this. Um, and then I just, I think because it happened so fast, I just took that leap of faith and it was really, really scary. Um, but when I got there, when I say a world away from what I was used to in the suburb of Dublin, like it was just like it was rural Moldova, it was crazy. But that, when you're taken out of your comfort zone, but not quite put into somewhere that's uncomfortable, but you're allowed to learn, I think it just really allowed me to develop personal and social development skills that I like now can label as that, but I didn't know was that at the time. And I think that first experience um, of even adulting on my own I had to use a washing machine and I'd never done that <laughs> so it was like these you know these things um, and then to come back and say do you know what I kind of have an idea of where I kind of want to go now and then to start that journey into that and then to be here today and know what I'm doing today is just absolutely madness um, but it was just taking that one little step and I didn't realize the impact that that would have and here I am years later like it's crazy yeah it's amazing I, I um I love that yeah, that you uh, you you said um, that she, where, where's Moldova immediately after it, yeah. but it just goes to show the the willingness for the adventure there. But I think you said something very important. That you said people like me just don't do this. So mm -hmm. I think that's the the value of like broadening horizons. And we talk about broadening horizons kind of casually and sometimes, but it really does have a huge impact. It kind of helps you rethink yourself and your path in life. So you know, no, it really, really does because like young people there's so many young people out there that are not afforded the same opportunities and it is you know things like the ESC which was the EVS when I was there that it creates a sort of level equality of playing part um yeah. which just and I suppose my we always say that my experience of it is even more unique because I am from a middle class area but not from a middle class income family um yeah. so I watched all these people around me do all these incredible things and we, it just wasn't a position we were in to do and now to go on to work in a in an environment where nearly all the young people are not afforded some opportunities but then to be able to help them afford them and other organizers it's just an amazing thing and I'll always advocate for the yeah. program great absolutely and I think yeah I, I think it's just the difference that equality and opportunity makes to, to people um and I suppose just did you know that were you interested in going into youth work before the European Solidarity before that experience um, or did this kind of lead you towards that path now where you're you're now bringing groups on uh, Solidarity Corps projects? Well, I knew I'd always wanted to work, I suppose, in some capacity with people because I loved learning but I wasn't necessarily the most academic person. Like I was never gonna be an office job person. I love talking as I'm sure you can all guess. So <laughs> when I knew I was going into people, but I actually thought I might go into a sort of social care disability setting. Um, mm -hmm. And while I was in Moldova then it was young men predominantly with disabilities. It was a community house for young men there with those disabilities. And then it was kind of working with them while also having the opportunity to teach English to siblings and other village children who are going to be moving to Western European countries and who'd need that English that I kind of was like, oh, I kind of like, you know, oh, this is kind of great. And then when I came back, it was again that world when that another EVS came up and this time it was in a youth project in Macedonia, which is actually where one of the guests here today, Megan, she's over there now in the same project, which is crazy. And that gave me a deeper insight and then I ended up completing a degree in it. I now hold the job in it. I went on then further to do that master's in human rights and social policy because it's just led me to want to do stuff at a deeper and more national level because as I said the definition of that young person has come back you know I have seen it from both sides now and just that hunger the fire in the belly to want to do more. Yeah. Absolutely. It's a great, a wonderful example of, you know, when, when people design programs like 
the European Solidarity Corps, this is what they're hoping to achieve. And so I suppose to see it, I'm sure um, Suzanne and Nolene and others from Nergus are just, you know, it just shows the real value of it and all the work that goes into it to try and to see the, the impact that it has on individuals. It's just fantastic. Um, and my, my other uh, panellist, Stefania, uh, you were quite similar in that you, you started with the, an EBS project, which was the, the, the predecessor programme to the European Solidarity Corps. Um, and you've also had that experience of being both the participant in one of these projects and now a project leader. So I suppose from your perspective, what has that experience taught you and what impact do you see the Solidarity Corps having in your organisation and among your own volunteers now? Um, well, first of all, I can totally relate to Amy. Um, it's just I got goosebumps just listening to you, um, which is which is great. It's exactly like you said, uh, Emma. Exactly what you want from uh, an experience like this. Um, my idea. So you know, Amy went from Ireland to another country. I came from another country to Ireland. Never left. Uh, the idea was, you know, come to Ireland, learn, learn the language, go back home. I work in a hotel. So yeah, that didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> um, my project was supposed to be, it was EBS, the same as uh, Amy's, uh, was supposed to be for nine months. Actually, it was originally for six months, uh, but I really wanted to come. So I came three months earlier. <laughs> they allowed me to, my organization. And uh, I ended up staying there for two years. Um, then I thought, hmm, okay, I seem to be good at this and I like it. Uh, so went to college, got my degree, and the rest is history, really. Um, never worked uh, with people with disabilities before. Um, and I suddenly realized, yeah, this is maybe what I want to do. So like I said, you know, got a, got a place in social care uh, with the idea of do, just doing two years and at the same time keep on improving my English. And then, uh, you know, third year came and fourth year came. So, yeah. Uh, after my um, ADS project then, you know, obviously studies and I volunteered a lot. Uh, our, the founders of Kingsborough Community were volunteers themselves. So volunteering and non-formal education in Kingsborough is, has a huge value. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's very important to us. In fact, we always say well, Kingsborough would not be um, what it is today. And, has been if it wasn't for the volunteers, uh, both local volunteers, national and international volunteers. Um, the impact to you know to the actual volunteer, you can hear it, you know, I think in my voice and Amy's and all other stories that I can tell you. Uh, a lot of people like me came to Kings River with the idea, you know, the volunteer who was with me at the time wanted to become a policeman and he's a social care worker himself now in his own country. Um, you know, uh, my original sending organization is still one of our strongest partners. Um, the second last volunteer who came from there is now a staff member as well. So we have loads of this, what I would like to call success stories, if you like. Um, the organization, then the people we support in the organization are considered people with fewer opportunities in, you know, on ESC language, if you like, um, but of course it's a it's it's a different, I suppose, uh, different um, fewer opportunity, if you like. Um, so even just the comparison between the volunteers who arrive in our project and the people we support and put things into perspective for both groups, um, they they learn about cultures, they learn um, about different life experiences. They learn what it is to have fewer opportunities. You know, uh, we talk about fewer opportunities, but what does that mean? Um, but they also learn all the possibilities that are out there, um, you know, in the world, and they can also take part in it. Um, so uh, my my immediate aim will be for some of our the people that we support to actually do an ESC volunteer volunteer and experience somewhere. Uh, we have had two people going to um, Slovakia. A good few years ago now for two weeks and they worked in a kind of a summer camp for children and they absolutely loved the experience uh, and now some of the other people we support were still in the age bracket I suppose they want to leave as well uh, so it opens opportunities that our 
the people we support would not have otherwise. They wouldn't even know about it if it wasn't for me and all the rest of the volunteers coming in. Um, so it's, and the staff as well. Um, the staff, the students, we have a social care students, healthcare students, we have students uh, sometimes coming for their, um, their year, they're still in, in secondary school. And uh, now they want to leave as well. <laughs> so they want to do an ESC experience because they, you know, they talk to all these international volunteers and they see the opportunities. Um, and also uh, this year, uh, we just uh, started actively to send volunteers abroad. So currently I have a volunteer in uh, Portugal working with the Red Cross and I have another volunteer working in Greece at the border with Albania in a refugee camp teaching English. So yeah, the opportunities are just, it's it's mind blowing. One hundred percent. Gosh, it's a very another really inspiring, um, another really inspiring story. And I suppose the value of it there that you know, uh, it was for for Ireland's benefit that you know you decided to stay on, and yeah. you know that um, uh, just how the impact that it has on the course of people's lives, I think, is just really extraordinary. Um, and like and, I said, you know, in the beginning, as a young person, you don't really realize it. No, absolutely. You want to leave for different reasons. Uh, my family also couldn't afford to send me to university or anything like that. Uh, I'm the eldest. Uh, there were other two siblings, you know, conditions where, you know, unemployment was really, really high. So, yeah, it was a moment in my life to decide what do I do? Yeah, absolutely. And that's it. And I think that it's, you know, that's what young people have is that, that drive to kind of have adventure and new experiences and, you know, that's what entices them in. You know, there's a lot of questions about how do we engage young people and how do we, it's particularly those with your fewer opportunities. And, you know, in many ways, these kinds of activities are the answer, you know, meet them Definitely. with things that they're interested in, that they, you know, that, that serve them as experiences and then, you know, good things will follow. Um, and certainly, it's, you know, it's the value of that uh, combined with the, the value of non-formal education, because yeah. let's face yeah. it, you know, the formal education is not for everybody. Not everybody yeah. can stay in the classroom, you know, uh, reading for books and everything, you know, and that doesn't mean that they are not as valuable or they're not as smart. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, 100 percent. And I think, well, from from what I've heard so far, it seems that the European Solidarity Corps creates youth workers and social workers uh, from it. So that's that's also great. Um, thank you, Stefania. And just I, I wanted to come back to Vicky. It was actually something that Stefania mentioned there about partnership and partnering with other countries and, and the benefits and value of that. And I know, Vicky, you have your own experience there through Erasmus Plus projects. Um, so I suppose, from for, again, from a volunteer Ireland perspective, you know, sometimes partnering with other organizations can seem like a hassle and a headache. And, you know, you know, what's the, what's the, uh, you know, we're busy enough with other things as it is. What would you say to organizations like that? What's the value in your experience of partnership through things like Erasmus Plus or the European Solidarity Corps? Well, the, the main, um, I suppose the main positive, I must just say it's lovely listening to Amy and <laughs> Stefania there. I whisked away for a minute. Um, yeah, yeah the, the main benefits um, from it is, is, is just the sharing. It's just the sharing of, um, you, you know, standards, the sharing of different um, understandings, diff different uh, aspects, quality standards, you know, things that it broadens your horizons as an organization. It stops you getting very blinkered in the way that we do things here this way. Um, yeah. and, and then you start looking and hearing how other people do things. And in another way, maybe in, like we've got a project at the moment with partners in Croatia and Norway and uh, you know, they're very different perspectives um, from what you would have in Norway to what you would have in Croatia. Um, but, you know, it's it's all having ha having the broader horizon and the, and the bigger outlook. It, it, it just stops you getting complacent, I suppose, as well. Um, yeah, so it, it, it's fantastic to sort of learn from other organisations. And, you know, with the European Solidarity Corps, I, you know, there is that network as well. Um, you can you can share your own experience as well, of course, and, and learn other, you know, your best practice. Um, you can see where your, where your best practice lies on an international level <coughs> with the other organisations and see what their um, best practice is. And, and it gives you the opportunity to improve yours. Um, yeah, so it just yeah. opened up your organization really to, to new ideas and new opportunities and gives you that sort of long term sustainability that we're uh, that we're all looking for. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, well, particularly like as, um, as, as Stefania mentioned there as well, you know, so many organizations 
are built on and really rely on volunteers, you know, and couldn't exist without it. So, you know, investing in your capacity and into the quality of your volunteer experiences, I think is a good That's strategic true. decision for any organization, you know. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And, and kind of, I suppose on that, Amy, you talked about your own kind of personal experience of the European Solidarity Corps uh, before, and it was very, very inspiring. Um, but I suppose as a youth worker now, I mean, from that organizational perspective, um, looking at the, the young people that you're working with, are you seeing this? Do you think yours was a, a one-off experience um, or do, are you seeing that kind of impact um, on others in the same way? And, and, you know, as a youth worker, is it a satisfying experience? Yeah, I think it's one of those things where even when you turn around to become a coordinator, it's still very much a learning experience, as is everything, because it's just continuous learning and development, which I think is the wonderful thing about it. You don't get stagnated in it. And even when I had the opportunity to go as my first ever time to be the coordinator, to go to Greece to work with refugees in Athens, I was still a, I'm still a young person myself, so that opportunity was one thing, but then to watch those young people who are essentially my peers also have this experience and me see it from a side where I had to do receipts and I had to do, yeah. you know, go to the meetings and things, but then watch them. It was like this, you know, this weird moment where you look back into the past where they'd say certain things where I'd be like oh my god that's exactly what I did when I was that like yeah, but now I see it from a different perspective and to watch that project from start to finish I think it was three weeks and to watch you know the excitement and anticipation the struggles of I don't want to go to work tomorrow the thing of oh that party was so much fun to then most of them if not nearly all of them are now again working in either teaching studying community youth work you know and even the ones that said it wasn't what I thought it was the lessons that we reflected on upon coming home to watch all that and to go, oh my God, I did the same thing. It's just one of yeah. these things. And now working in the job that I'm in now, they used to send projects all the time. It slowed down over the last few years. And now we're gonna kickstart that again. And for me to be able to, you know, I decided in Macedonia, actually, this is what I wanna do. I don't just wanna do you work locally. I love it, but not forever. At some stage, I wanna go European. And then at some stage, I'd like to take a job in policy. When you know, yeah. I want to nine to five and all that, <laughs> but like to then say now in my new job, oh, this will be my role. And this all yeah. started from this one time that I was like, where's Moldova? Let's go. Like, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's just, it's an incredible yeah. journey. And I just, as I said, Steffi said about the informal education, like formal learning was not for me at the time. I just, mm. the idea of a triple mat on a Monday just drove me over the edge. <laughs> and to then go into this weird informal world of volunteering, to come mm. home, volunteer with local clubs, and just all this learning and for it to continue then to allow you to fall back in love with formal education. And although mm. it's not for everybody, it does open up so many doors. And it did mm. for me. And then I think for my family who never, you know, didn't sit there leaving certs or anything, for them to watch me get a master's degree and to love every minute of it rather than dread it it's just an incredible so when i say personal and career development goals and educational goals the whole program is just yeah, I love yeah. it. <laughs> you can see it absolutely 100 percent um and yeah it's just you, you've had that benefit i suppose of both the personal development and the professional development that comes with it as well which is just fantastic um Stefania, you're quite kind of similar, I suppose, in that you've had, you've had that experience of both the participant and the professional development. So how would you say it's impacted Kings River in terms of, you know, your organizational development, the development of your staff, and even, you know, being able to access volunteers that you can use in your everyday work um, or that you can involve in your everyday work? How, how would you say that, you know, the Solidarity Corps has affected you there? Oh my goodness, in so many different ways. Um, already all the, you know, the things that I said about, you know, the staff and the students we receive and the people we support themselves. Um, mm -hmm. So the accessibility of it all uh, is absolutely incredible, even just to be able to direct uh, people, young people uh, interested in it. Uh, mm -hmm. We link very much with, now we have the, um, uh, the volunteer Centre open up in Kilkenny as well which is great, we link in with them, and we have local volunteers coming to us. 
so, you know, like I said, since the beginning, you know, our founders believed in volunteering and non-formal education from the start. Uh, obviously, you know, as like everybody else, the last two years have been very difficult. Um, things have always gone to our founders retired in uh, September 2019. So we are undergoing a lot of change. Uh, so everything has been, I suppose, slowed down a little bit. Um, but the idea now with, you know, um, I've taken on board the, you know, full-time position as a, I suppose you can sum it up as a project management. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so the idea is for uh, the staff as well to do some um, international um, training, if not volunteering, because of course, you know, you have to be realistic and see lo the logistic of it all. Our work is supporting people you know, with intellectual mm -hmm. disabilities mainly, and that's our focus and it always will be. Yeah. Um, so even in terms of looking for volunteers and looking for people to uh, support our work, uh, mm -hmm. they have to have some sort of at least interest in, mm -hmm. in, you know, in what we do. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, we, we get a lot of that. Um, so mm -hmm. our project is very specific in that uh, we also, the volunteers live on let's call it on campus mm -hmm. so um it's you know one of the, the the biggest advantages i suppose is that we can provide accommodation which is yeah. obviously you know like everybody knows a huge huge issue issues in our issue in ireland um so it's not just about the working hours um you know ES, ESC is full-time so it, you know you're working full-time basically you're volunteering full-time uh, you have your two days off you know your holidays of course all these all these things but the way you share your life experience is not just work. Yeah. Um, it's everything. And uh, the relationship that builds between the volunteers and the people we support is very, very different from what a worker, a paid worker, can offer. Yeah. Um, so it adds up, it adds another layer, I suppose, uh, onto everything that we do. Uh, it's a little bit more maybe personalized, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, a lot of the people we support are still in contact with ex-volunteers, you know, via Facebook or volunteers come to visit or, yeah. you know, yeah. Um, yeah, the families get really attached to them yeah, as well, uh, families of the people we support, you know, they send presents and, they, you know, birthdays yeah. and Christmas and, you know, we're like big extended yeah. family, if you like. So, yeah, uh, very good. Yeah. yeah, no, I think it absolutely, there's the... I think you gave a little bit of an insight there in that there's a strategic interest as an organization and there's Absolutely. a really it's a it's not just a lovely thing to do it's it's a sound in strategic uh, decision for your organization yes. Absolutely. Our organization is built on relationships with yeah we value that but you know real relationships for people for mm -hmm. everybody uh, so for the people i support but also mm -hmm. you know for the volunteers we host mm -hmm. for the staff um which is you know yeah. human beings need yeah yeah 100 yeah, percent. no matter what, what yeah. your ability is so yeah. um, that fits right in. yeah absolutely no there's definitely there's the strategic but then there's very much the the heart behind it as well and the family and the networks and the friendships you can't really put a value on that um so listen i have i'm, I'm going to finish with one thing i'm going to ask each of my panelists for one final message and then i'm going to move on to suzanne um who is uh just to to um, wrap up a little bit and say a little bit about uh, what Lyricus can do to support anybody who might be inspired from our stories today. Um, and I think there's a couple of technical questions that have come up in the chat about like exactly how um, projects work, but we will get to them in the training that's just after the coffee break very soon. So don't, you know, those questions can be answered. But uh, for each of my panelists, in in we're, we're coming up on time, so just in as quick and as succinct as you possibly can, um, and I'll start with Vicky first, is, you know, a lot of our listeners today will be deciding whether they should start the European Solidarity Corps or whether if they're already involved, whether they should kind of scale up their activity. So what would your message be to them, to anybody who's listening in today? So Vicky, if you want to go first. OK, well, I, I suppose really speaking for organisations, there are, you know, the massive benefits to being involved. Um, you know, quite simply, it's just going to help your organisation to do more. You'll be able to, you know, focus on exactly what you need and you'll have a pool of those suitable volunteers to assist you whilst also having the funding um, to engage them. And, and then just the, the huge support that comes with it. So you're not on your own. You won't be out there on your own. There's massive support as well. So just go for it. Great, thank you, Ricky. And Amy, over to you, same question. I've yet to hear a negative experience of ESC. It's always been positive, even down to the little things that we talked about. 
that if a young person needs counselling or something that they attend here, they get it there. Just, it's just fantastic. Just go for it. You'll oh, be supported great. the whole way. Absolutely. Thank you, Amy. And Stefania, over to you, your, your answer. Um, I think my main thing is do it for the right reason. Know exactly why you want to do it. Don't just do it for money. It's not, you're not going to earn any money out of this. You're going to earn so much more than that. Uh, and get the organization on board. You can't do that by yourself. Um, Lurgus is extremely supportive and nearly hands on. So, you know, just yeah. go for Great it. Great, absolutely. It's a, very good, it's a very good point. It's an investment into your organization and your staff and your volunteers. Um, and, you know, it needs to bring everybody along with it in order to get the full, the full value of it. So look, really, really incredible stories and insights and learnings and everything there. Suzanne, uh, over to you, I suppose, from a Lergus perspective, what would you say to people in terms of, you know, if they're interested in getting involved and what can Lergus do to support them? Yeah, like I feel like uh, uh, everybody has said everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I suppose look, this is a mutually beneficial relationship you're talking about, you know, so absolutely this is massively like life-changing experience for a young person. And to be part of that and to watch that is amazing. Um, but also in terms of your organization and what you can do and who you're working with or what you're addressing. I know that there was an awful lot of uh, discussion around, you know, the community, um, so social, social care and, and uh, young youth work and stuff, but also there's a whole other uh, area that we do around sustainability um, organizations and like, I mean, like energy uh, to farming to, um, you know, rivers to whatever. So, um, there's so there's so much scope in the solidarity core for those organizations to participate and to have that same experience and um, you know uh, in terms of uh, you know doing more having that uh, nearly the kind of um almost uh you know the 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 reassurance that you will get your funding every year after uh, you get your quality label and um, for the seven years of the program that's massive that's all around your sustainability. It matches your strategic plan. You know, there's a lot of the connection of what you're doing anyway connects with the program and, and um, I suppose kind of strengthens your, your, um, your organization, but also kind of gives you all of that stuff around the partnership, you know, the sharing, the learning, the developing, and also recognizing that sometimes we actually don't realize how good we are at what we're doing. So often when you go and meet these partners, you're like, well, actually, we, we really do have our, our, our stuff together here. So there's all of this kind of um, experiences. Uh, like I said, Lurgus is, a, is we take this high support approach. Uh, we know that the, the first step is the hardest um, with anything new. And so we walk you through that process. Um, there's lots of different, um, you know, trainings. And, and in each training, then we signpost you to your next step. Um, Nolan and I are always uh, available to answer any questions, no stupid questions. Um, there's no such thing. Um, and then obviously the team as well behind us in terms of the finance and all that kind of stuff, they're always there as well. Um, so what I would say is in, in January, there will be um, a discovery day where you'll hear more about what the program is and then obviously we'll stay for Nolan's um, bit after this. But, um, and then after that, then there is quality label hubs where, you know, you, you Talk about your quality label, you'll, you'll learn about what's required for that, and then application clinics and all that kind of stuff. And then, like I said, all the thematic training. So there's loads and loads. Um, and keep an eye on our calendar. Um, we haven't got our dates just yet because obviously, with the changing situation, um, we went from face to face back to online and all that kind of stuff. So, um, but yeah, you know, um, we're here to support you, answer any questions that you have, and we'd love to hear from you. Great, thank you very much, Suzanne. Um, uh, absolutely, there's uh, there's so many opportunities in this, and I hope that uh, people will stay on on after the, the coffee break that we're going to have now, um, to to learn to do a bit more of a deep dive um, with your colleague Nolene, who will be walking people through how to get started and a bit more information about the program, and will answer any kind of technical questions that anybody might have. Um, so just to quickly note, um, we have uh, just one second now. Um, 
I just want need to quickly note that uh, this event was brought to you by uh, Lergus, but also Access Europe, which is our programme at the wheel to support uh, civil society involvement in EU programmes. So we provide all kinds of services, so updates on EU funding deadlines, free training and events like this one, one-to-one -one, um, advice and support and things like that, and then networking opportunities uh, locally and at EU level. That's the team there. And my, my two colleagues, Emily and Christina, are here today. And we'd really encourage you just to sign up to our newsletter, follow us on Twitter, um, and um, uh, reach out to us if, there's, if you have any questions at all about European programmes. Um, and just to note that this is one of the series. So um, we did youth last week and now we're on volunteering. So we will be doing inclusion in adult education um, next week. And we'll send you all of this so you can register. We'll also send you what um, uh, Suzanne mentioned there about this session in January for people who want to follow up on that. So all of the information will be in a follow up email along with all of our slides and everything like that. And we things are going to culminate in our Access Europe showcase, which is on the 13th of December. So this is where we will be uh, presenting the results um, and, and some success stories around EU funding uh, that Access Europe has supported in the last year, but also um, uh, we're launching our new EU funding guide and partnership database uh, where Irish civil society organizations can showcase themselves to their European counterparts um, in the hope of forming more um, partnerships and things like that. Um, and so just to note that Access Europe is funded by the Department of Foreign Affairs. We are going to go for a coffee break now in uh, in a moment, but I just really want to thank all of my panelists, uh, Vicky and Amy and Stefania and Suzanne, of course, um, and Nolene soon, who will be doing the, the, the training after the coffee break. Uh, for a really excellent session and for sharing all of your experience and your insights and everything. It was just a really lovely chat and really nice to hear about all of your fantastic um, experiences. It's just great. And I hope that it's inspired people to get involved. Um, so listen, we are at 11 when you're ready. Great. OK, look, we're going to start kicking off the second half of today's session. Um, and just say thanks again to everybody for joining us and for staying with us. Hopefully you were inspired by the first half of our session to, to get involved and to look at how the European Solidarity Corps can benefit your organisation. Um, so with that, we're going to hand over to Nolene O'Callaghan from Lergus um, to do, give us a, a, a training and an overview of what are the next steps. So Nolene, over to you when you're ready. Thanks a million. Thanks a million. Thank you. Um, can you hear me OK? Sorry, there was a funny echo there yeah. when I spoke. Yeah, no. Is it okay? okay. <laughs> um, lovely to, to spend the morning listening to, to all of that. And if I could bottle what Amy and Stefania said, it make our jobs a lot easier because that's there's nothing like an authentic voice and for people to, to actually speak their experience of the things that Suzanne and I tell people about. So for the next uh, couple of minutes, I'm going to, as, as Emma said, take a deeper dive into the Solidarity Corps and everything that Suzanne had outlined about it and just, I suppose, signpost you into what your next steps might be and how to get more involved in the programme. Um, before I do that, I have a short video that I'm going to attempt to share and, uh, and play, so bear with me for one moment. Before I put this on, just to, to put the context to it, this is a just a short video um, highlighting a few of the projects that have run over the past, say, two years under the Solidarity Corps. So again, volunteers and organisations talking about their experience and just contextualising the, the work of the Solidarity Corps. So I'll play that. And then when we come back after that, I'll take some of the questions that were already in the chat just to, to address those. And then I'll go into the the deeper dive as we say so hopefully all of this will work now and you can hear everything when it comes on can you hear it the european solidarity yeah. corps project that the gloves was involved in was called art in action and it's built upon a, a program of creative activities that the museum have been running for a number of years with young asylum seekers and as part of the european solidarity corps project we teamed up with a group of volunteers from university college corp when ty first approached us about it and said oh i want to do an art workshop with kids from dark prison i was like yes i love art creativity and i really enjoy working with the kids and anything that i can do to make people or help people have a little bit of a nicer time, happier life, I'm happy to do it. 
Evolve Your Project Team is an organization that works um, for specifically with young people from the traveling community and other young people um, who are disadvantaged, aged from about eight years of age up to 25. Um, our main focus will be on young people who are aged 10 to 18. We do many different programs um, from homework, after school support to STEAM programs, um, concentrate on science, technology, anything that has maths, and we also do Erasmus work. It was originally planned that we would go for day trips and uh, meet up and do other activities with other people all across Europe. But with COVID, we had to do it online. It was still amazing. I got to meet loads of amazing people uh, and have some really nice experiences. Uh, learned a lot about solidarity, collective consciousness, and things like that. Park Jordan Community Farm is a community supported agricultural project. The idea is that through a membership model, we can ensure that farmers get paid well on time on a monthly basis, which allows them to grow food without the stress, without the financial stress involved. As a, as a group, we take the risk. You know, if you have a bad year, if it's a bad frost, if it's the odd drought, stuff like that, that we all kind of take on that responsibility together. With the ASC, I've come to Ireland. I've moved back here because I'm an Irish national and a Shelley national as well too. Uh, I've come for this opportunity for farming and within a community called the Cross Jordan Community Farm. Uh, it's an eco village and it's a learning opportunity for young people 18 to 30, like myself and Jorge. On Mondays, we do sports activities with the kids, uh, and it's probably their favourite thing to do. They love to run around and uh, get all sweaty and crazy. So, this is a game called Bomb. Um, throw the ball and if someone drops the ball you've got 10 seconds to get rid of the ball or you're out uh, at the spring so we're trying to meet the my team as well uh, so yeah handling covid and then being outside and doing all of that uh, that was eventful and fun this is in one of the rooms like down in the basement of the glassman and oh my god it's a room that can just be like art goes everywhere you know, the, there's, we push back the tables, paper on the floor, all the, you know, pencils, paints, and the kids come in off the, we walk over from the bus, and they come into the Glutzman, and it's just like, okay, we're here, we're ready to do art, the room is just chaos, but the good kind of chaos. It's one of my favourite things about being here at UCT, was getting to do these workshops. Uh, this is our first few weeks. <laughs> And uh, we've got the Kubota tractor here, four heads on the back. We've just done a load and we're taking it back to the farm. Uh, it's great we uh, were able to learn how to drive the tractor, whether we, we know or not. Um, but there's lots of opportunities for us here, which is great. Um, also, my grandfather has the same Kubota, so it's quite nice for me to be driving that. I feel like I'm back to my childhood. Having this international group of young people in our town just adds this vibrancy and energy and gives opportunities for, for local young people to stay in town and give them a reason to, you know, to come back and visit often. I think it was really important for our young volunteers to feel connected to other groups around Europe, to understand that actually they're not working in isolation, but rather they are part of a wider movement of young people who are working towards similar goals. I have friends all over Europe now, so it, it's amazing. Like, you think when you get to a certain age that you're not going to keep um, broadening your friendship pool, but you do, and it, it's fabulous. Growing up mixed race in Ireland, I've benefited a lot from community outlets uh, and other programs like that, and I really wanted to give back uh, and kind of take what I had learned from, from my own experience and, and being able to give that to young people that would be the age that I uh, originally got involved in volunteering. I think it's important to me because community, the people who surround me, everybody. I like I like working with people. And if I can, you know, help make someone's life a little bit easier or um, open up some opportunities or some doors to other people, then why not use that time for something like that? For me it's important because I don't know when when I help like people or animal or nature or whatever, like I feel better with myself. I, I like volunteering basically the same reasons as Jorge, but also it gives uh, people like myself an opportunity to 
work in fields that we might not have access to in a work setting. So by volunteering, there's always a need that you're giving back to a community or a project, but also you're gaining these skills and experiences for yourself that's going to propel you for the future as well. I think it's a great opportunity. So anyone who's 18 to 30 should definitely look into this. I would love to continue volunteering. Uh, I'd really like to volunteer abroad. It's, it's been nice volunteering at home. I have volunteered before abroad as well, but I'd like to keep going. I would do this again in an absolute heartbeat. In fact, I hope and I think we will have more projects uh, with the Glucksman. But something that's going to propel you for your future. You're always learning. And if it's an interest that you like, it's worth honing in on. Okay, so that was our, our video. And I think that just um, really reinforces everything. Oh, sorry, my my video is continuing to, to talk behind me there. Sorry, hold on. My job is to make college easier because. Okay. Um, I'm back. <laughs> um, what I was saying there was that video really just reinforces everything we, we heard from Amy and Stefania really, and then shows a little bit more of the scope of organisations that are involved in the European Solidarity Corps. And Suzanne alluded to that earlier, and really the sky's the limit um, if you're working in your communities and if you're, you're um, the reason why you're involved in your organisations or if your organisation's reason for existing is to address a societal issue and to, to, to address a need, whether that's people, whether that's the environment, whatever it is that you're doing in your organisation, the European Solidarity Corps is certainly a vehicle to support you to do that work. And it is very much about bringing young people and organisations together. It's not just about bringing a young person into your organisation and let's find something for them to do. It's really about bringing that um, solidarity piece together where, where a young person can join your organization and be part of what you do. So again, I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Um, to... Just give me one moment. My favorite part of Zoom are, are the, the quiet minutes when you're not really sure what's going on and whether people can see what you're doing or not see what you're doing. Okay, I'm not sure that and I can't see any of you to, to know whether I am or I'm not. No, it's not showing now anyway, Nolan. Okay, okay. I'll go back to it in one second, actually. Before I did that, what I wanted to do was just take a quick look at the, the comments box, because I know there's a question sitting in there since earlier on regarding travel insurance, and I just wanted to address that very quickly before I get into the, the detail of the Solidarity Corps. The insurance that Suzanne mentioned, the health insurance that she mentioned, is a health insurance that all volunteers who have been approved to be part of a Solidarity Corps uh, project, they're enrolled in a particular health insurance cover that covers them during their, their volunteering time. So it isn't travel insurance. So for young people who are traveling here, when they book their flights, they either choose to take out their travel insurance. If they're coming from EU member states, that's generally straightforward. If they're coming from a country where they require an entry visa, the travel insurance will be part of that entry visa requirement. And depending on the, the destination um, and the, or the country that they're traveling from will depend on how detailed that travel insurance needs to be. So there isn't a straightforward answer to that, but the insurance we refer to in the European Solidarity Corps is very specifically health insurance that is provided for, for young people who are part of the European Solidarity Corps. And then for the length of the programmes, and I'll be going into that now in one moment, um, for long-term volunteering, it's either two months to 12 months. So the young, young person is going to volunteer for either anything from two months up to 12 months. So I'm going to attempt to share the screen again now, and hopefully this will work this time. Okay. Can you see that now? Yes. <laughs> yeah, we can see it. Grand, brilliant. Okay, I'll just presentation mode. There we go. Okay, so I'm where I should be, and we've seen the video, so I'll just skip through that bit. 
Okay, so the program itself, and this is really just to get a little deeper into the specific objective of the program, and it, that is, as we have been talking about all morning, really, to give young people accessible learning opportunities in high quality solidarity activities. And really, when you apply for your quality label, that's where all of that information will sit and where it's assessed as to the, the standard that those activities are and what they're going to be, how they're going to contribute to positive changes in society so how the work that you do as an organization contributes to positive change and then how by bringing young people in to be involved in the work that you do will contribute to positive change and how in that activity so by bringing in the young person to be part of your organization to ensure that we're facilitating the continuous engagement of young people as active citizens so the the solidarity corps is really a vehicle for young people people to be able to have their say and what their communities look like to have a voice in how organizations and issues are addressed in local community and then the wider society so a way for young people to be part of change and to, to feel that they have a place to play in, in, in all of that. So Suzanne had shown you this um, diagram earlier on. So under the Solidarity Corps, we have centralised actions and decentralised actions. Most of what we're talking about today fits in here in the decentralised actions. Um, the centralised are for organisations who will apply directly to Brussels for funding. So they'd be for organisations that are already probably involved in the European Solidarity Corps. Um, and again, as, as Suzanne mentioned earlier as well, there is a specific quality label that you apply for for those activities. And there, the, the volunteering in high priority areas has been ring fenced to deal with the recovery from COVID-19. And then the, the humanitarian aid, which would have been EU aid, will come in under the European Solidarity Corps from 2022. But for, for this morning, really, we're focusing in on the decentralised actions, the quality label to apply for decentralised actions, and looking particularly then at the volunteering strand. So under the volunteering strand, you first do need to have your quality label in order to have access to that. And I'll talk to you about that in a, a moment now. But under the volunteering strand then, what is it and who can be involved in it? So it offers volunteering opportunities to either individuals. So you as an organization may want to either involve young people in your organization, or you may want to send young people abroad to be involved in volunteering. So you may be an organization working directly with young people or in your life, in your, you, you may be volunteers yourselves in your community. You may interact with young people in that that way you may want to apply to be a sending organization um, so it's either you're either going to host or send or do both for individual volunteers and then there's also teams and a team is anything from 10 up to 40 young people who come together to carry out a particular task for teams it's generally young people who are, are rather activities that can be done in a short period of time so a team come in they complete an activity together and and then that's that piece of volunteering is done if you like and um, they're all for 18 to 30 year olds so you must be 18 in order to be involved and up to 30 and um, the duration for the individuals is two months to 12 months so you can bring people, young people into your organizations for anything between two and 12 months. However, there is also um, an additional opportunity for young people with fewer opportunities. So you may be working with young people who you feel a commitment of two months up to 12 months is too much for them and a shorter period of time may help them to build their confidence and for them to feel that they may then be able to go on and do a longer term. So there is a shorter term um, volunteering opportunity for, for younger people and that can be or for, for young people with fewer opportunities and that can be anything from two weeks up to two months. The team then volunteering is again two weeks to two months, so shorter periods of time. The venues for these, so they can be in country, so the, the volunteers themselves can choose to either volunteer in Ireland, so for Lergas, it, the in country is Ireland, so you may have young people who are living in Ireland, they can be Irish people or they can be young people living here with Irish res residency, so they can carry out their individual volunteering here in Ireland, 
or cross border, which refers to going abroad. So sometimes in the Irish context, when we speak about cross border, people can get confused and think we're talking about north south border, but it's either in country or cross border as in going to other European countries for individuals and for the team up to 75% of the team can be in country so in team volunteering you are going to have that international um, aspect to it as well. So that's the, the length of time. And in order to, to be able to access those individual volunteering opportunities, you first have to have one. We've referred to this a lot this morning, and that is the quality label. So if you like, it's your entry into the European Solidarity Corps. And the quality label really is where you define your organization's objectives um, under an activity plan, but it's really where you are going to lay out why it makes sense for your organization to be involved in the European Solidarity Corps, strategically what would that look like for your organization, and then what would the activities be. So you make the make sense of it first at a strategic level, and then you explain to us in the quality label what that would look like. So how many volunteers would you be bringing in? How would you support those volunteers? What will they do in the organization? How will the activities that you describe for those volunteers link to the work you do and help you then achieve your strategic goals? So it's very much a, a layered process. So you're, you're looking at the overall strategic aims of your organization, and you're also looking at the strategic aims of the European Solidarity Corps. And from a policy context, the Solidarity Corps sits very much in the European Youth Strategy and the European Youth Goals. So when you're writing your quality label, if you look at that policy context for the European Solidarity Corps, it can help you to, to um, strategically drill down into why it makes sense for your organisation to be part of the programme. So your activity plan, which is where you're laying out what, you're, what you're, you hope to do over the duration of the quality label. So that's anything from three years to seven years in duration. The quality label itself um, is a seven year uh, quality label. And in your, your first application to it or your, your first quality label, you're going to lay out the first three years of those seven years. Or you can give us the seven all in one. Most organizations would, would choose or opt to give us a three-year plan um, within their, their quality label. So that's how you, you, I suppose, gain entry to the European Solidarity Corps. It's completing your, your quality label application and having that approved. And then that opens up the grant application for you. So Suzanne mentioned earlier, there are two grant applications in 2022. The first one is February. And then that's followed by um, a grant application deadline next October. So if you wanted to, or if you think that you want to start involving volunteers in your organization, say within the next 12 months, you would need to now start thinking about your quality label and having that ready and approved before either of those deadlines. February is absolutely too soon for organizations that don't already hold a quality label, um, unless you've been engaging with us already and are already on the road to, to completing it. Um, so it would be really next October for, for organizations who are looking for the, the first time to access that. Uh, access funding even it would be the October deadline that you'd work towards but you would have that quality label in and approved with us way before then. So the budget categories then if you do get your quality label then and you apply for the grant the budget categories and that would cover the volunteers travel so the young person's return travel and um, you receive organizational support so funding to help you to, to carry out um, your project inclusion support which is additional funding for the volunteer themselves so the individual volunteer may have additional needs and you can apply for additional support you will receive uh, funding to to provide pocket money to the volunteers there's linguistic support so the volunteer may not have fluent english if they're coming to ireland and they they receive um an online learning support to help them for their, their the duration of the time while they're here i've spoken about the insurance so the volunteers if they're from a European country where they have access to a European health insurance card, they must apply for that first. 
And then there is a very specific health insurance program that is works complementary to the health insurance card. If the young person is traveling from a country where they don't have access to a European health insurance card, then the, the, the ESC health insurance cover will cover them completely for, for their time here in Ireland. You may also apply for exceptional costs, and that was mentioned earlier as well, and therefore additional things that the young person might need in order for them to take part in uh, the volunteering. So it may be clothing, it might be a passport, they may never have been abroad before, so need to, to buy suitcases, all the practical things, and then if what yeah. you do as an organization, for example, in, in some of our, our organizations that work with us now, the volunteers will receive hepatitis jabs. Um, so that would be covered under the exceptional cost. So there are things that are associated very particularly to the work that the volunteer is going to be doing in your organization. And then this is what the budget looks like. And this is just an example to give you an idea of the type of funding that's available. So this is a breakdown for two young people traveling from Germany, coming to Ireland for um, a period of 12 months. So their travel from Germany, their travel bans for each uh, European destination. So Germany falls into the travel ban for 275 euros. So you get that for each of the volunteers. The organizational support you receive is 225 euro for each volunteer. You then um, receive activity costs. So they're the, the costs associated in, in carrying out the activity. And that's at 27 euro a day for the two volunteers. And that's the 19,764. Um, the pocket money allowance, depending on which European country you're in, it can change. And in Ireland, it's six euro per day for the volunteer. Most organizations would then augment that a little bit because I think we'd all acknowledge that six euro is a very small amount of money. So a lot of organizations will have additional funding to increase that slightly. And then inclusion support. So if you do um, involve volunteers who need additional support, you can receive an extra nine euro a day for the volunteers in order to provide whatever that, that additional support might be. So a total grant for two volunteers coming from Germany for 12 months is the 31,744 euro. Um, if you've two volunteers in Ireland, so if you choose to recruit your volunteers who are already resident in Ireland and aren't traveling to take up the opportunity, you can see it breaks down to the 31,194 euro. So you receive all the same um, support with regards to activity and pocket money and inclusion support and the organizational support. It's really the what's not there would be the travel. Um, obviously, there isn't a, a travel band if the, the young person is already resident in Ireland. So they're the volunteering projects and they're the when you choose to bring individuals or teams into your organizations to volunteer and you have already applied for and been approved your quality label to do that so that's the under the volunteering strand that's one of the the activities the other activity under the volunteering strand then are solidarity projects so these are separate from what we've been talking about so far and these are projects that are designed led and implemented by groups of young people themselves. So five young people can carry out a solidarity project and they themselves can decide what the project is on. Obviously it needs to fit into certain criteria and that really is that it's addressing a local community need and has a clear European um, dimension. Again, 18 to 30 year olds, and the projects can run from two months to 12 months. An average grant for a 12 month solidarity project is 10,000 10, euro. And these would be, this is more a part-time volunteering um, rather than the, the young person, say, stepping out of their lives and becoming involved in an organization for a long period of time. And that being full-time, this is much more volunteering that young people can carry out while they still get on with the, their, their life. So they may, may have jobs, they may be in college, they may be doing other things in their lives. So um, solidarity projects are similar to the organizations that can be involved in the, the solidarity court, solidarity projects themselves can tackle multiple and numerous uh, 
um, community issues. So at the moment, we have solidarity projects running with young people addressing mental health issues, racism, um, sustainability issues that are very specific then to local areas. We've one currently running in Donegal looking at speed, car crime and speeding. So things that are unique to, to regions and to particular communities. The young people themselves can write the grant application. These are deadlined, so similar to the grant application for volunteering projects. It would be February and October. The young people themselves can apply for these. They do not need a quality label to do so, or they can choose to have an organization support them. So you might become a support organization for a group of young people to carry out a solidarity project. So they're just the, the two different opportunities that are there under the European Solidarity Corps. Um, I am going to stop sharing the screen now and um, take any questions you have. But really what I want to concentrate on now is what has inspired you from what you've heard so far this morning? So what are you taking from everything that you've heard from the, the, the Amy and Stephanie outlining their experiences to then the outline of the Solidarity Corps itself? And then what do you think are your next steps? So what makes sense for you as a, an organisation? What do you think you, you're going to do next? And how can we help you in that? So how can Lerka support you in that? So. I want to stop sharing because you may have noticed I'm not the most comfortable sharing a screen on Zoom because I find it very awkward speaking to a presentation and not to people. So do we have any particular questions? I don't see anything new added to the chat just yet. So I suppose what I want to do is stop talking and ask you, do you have any questions? Because that was a bit of a whistle stop again. Um, and it was really just putting in context and going slightly deeper into what you might need to do, and what it, what it might look like to, to start to involve either young people in your organizations or to start sending them and to let you know what that quality label application looks like. So if anyone wants to, to um, share what they feel they've been inspired by this morning, or if you've pressing questions or something that you definitely know you want to ask me about, now's the time. I just see there was one message from, uh, <clears throat> or one question from Jerry. Um, does travel funding cover costs for traveling to non-EU countries? Does travel funding cover costs for traveling to? It, it covers the cost for if a young person is traveling wherever they're going. Yes, there is a travel band for the destinations that the young people are going to. So depending on where they're traveling to will depend on the, the travel band that they fit into. And then there are other, there under exceptional costs, you can also apply for additional funding for the travel, for exceptional, um, for expensive travel, sorry, it's expensive travel. So if it is more expensive, you can apply for the travel under that as opposed to the travel band. And so, yes, fundamentally, it should not cost the young person to 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 travel. That they shouldn't have to to pay for their travel yet. Okay. And I there's another one. There? Uh, no, no, sorry. sorry. Um, okay. okay. We, uh, we we send people, people to uh, to uh, Africa. Africa. Okay. And we usually send uh, transition year students as, as a class. class. So is, is, is that, that type of uh, operation that we covered by? It wouldn't be that 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 type of, of volunteering, um, Carol. They'd have to be over 18, so 18 year olds, oh, so not, not the school true. gone. So it would be the Erasmus Plus program do the the exchanges and the school exchanges. Um but for while it, the European Solidarity Corps is open to the European member states and then partner countries. So different parts of, of Africa, there would be countries that are covered, but not necessarily. It's not global. So in the programme guide, all of the countries that, that the European Solidarity Corps is open to, um, you, you will see the countries that participate. So there needs to have been a legal partner program, a legal partnership established with countries outside of the European mm. Union to participate in the, the Solidarity Corps. So it'd be slightly different than sending groups to 
to countries that you might choose yourself that you want to send. They need to be countries that are participating in the European Solidarity Corps and that there is a legal partnership with the European Solidarity Corps with those countries. So is there any information on your website? Like, what countries there are? is, absolutely. And it's in our programme guide. I can send that on to you, Carl, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I can. There, there's the par parts of... Um, what would have been uh, the the USSR, so the the Russian Federation, the South Mediterranean countries, the okay. Eastern Partnership countries, Western Balkans. So there is yes, there's different categories of countries. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I asked a question. Don't don't to, uh, I asked a question, question about the travel insurance. insurance. You know, like, like that, that chapter that down in Clock Garden, they were involved in uh, physical work. You know, normally, travel insurance doesn't cover physical work. Yes. So, and do they have to get their own insurance if you already came from Australia to do that work or something? Is that just, well, that you would. Sense? If you're coming to, to a country, You travel insurance is for people who are coming in as tourists and traveling. So if you're going to a country to carry out either a job or as a volunteer, if you're going there to be involved in physical work, that's where a health insurance cover comes in and that's why I was ex explaining that it's different than just travel insurance and if you're traveling to countries where you need a visa the country themselves will have very specific criteria that they will need you to ensure you have covered in your your travel insurance so it isn't a blanket answer yeah. to that Carl it depends on the country it depends on the requirements of the visa for the for the person to enter that country okay so thank you no problem at all. Nice to meet you, Carl. Um, thank you. Good. You too. I just saw, Nolene, sorry, there was another question similar enough just from Fiona there. Yeah. Uh, can an Irish organisation send volunteers to African countries? So similar response. <laughs> it would be similar, but also from, from next year on with the EU aid coming in under the European Solidarity Corps as well, those destinations will will you know, open up. So we will have more on that next year in 2022, um, which is around the corner now, but we will when when the, the old EUA programme comes in under the European Solidarity Corps. Yes, yeah, absolutely. That will change. So so keep in touch with us on that. And that would be the the, the centralised application. So you wouldn't be applying to Lirgas for those. They're the ones that will have the centralised applications where you'll apply to Brussels directly for the funding and your quality label for those. So they'd be different from, from what we do in Lirgas with regards to the requirements. But yes, that, that certainly is something that will be um, under the Solidarity Corps from next year, but, but centralised. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, just to note, we're, we're, we've got, uh, we had a longer time session, but we might aim to finish off at 12, just because yeah, um, there's a smaller group and we can, so if anybody has any final questions, please do. If you want to type them in, that's fine, but you can also just unmute yourself and fire away. Um, yeah, I think I it, it, in a, in a, an opportunity like this, it's just nice to talk and to, to yeah. take, you know, from where you are now, having heard all the information this morning, there was quite a lot in the, the solidarity core regards to the technical side of it. Um, mm -hmm. And there is, obviously, we wouldn't expect an organization to go away from this this morning feeling they know everything, but what I would love to know is, what are you taking away that's inspired you about it? And what do you think that you now as an organization, your next step in order to maybe get more involved with us, is it to, to come to our discovery day where you will hear about not just the Solidarity Corps, but also the Erasmus Plus opportunities, or do you want, would it make more sense for you to, to actually have a chat with Suzanne or I to tell us what your project idea is so we can point you in the right direction or, so it's really, I'd love to hear the stuff that, that's inspired you maybe from, from this morning, if anyone, anybody would like to yeah, share. Well, I was uh, going back, back in again there, there. No, sorry, You're we okay. have a project, we have a project in Africa, Africa and uh, we're looking, looking for somebody to, to uh, assistant director and I would imagine somebody in 18 or 30 age group might be a, a good bet for that type of thing you know so that's just one thing that is still be thinking you know along those lines you know so as well as that I'm sorry uh, I didn't hear the European uh, authority you know when I was younger okay yeah yeah, yeah me too <laughs>
Yeah, same. That's what I got from listening to. I was like, oh, why didn't I do this when I was younger? Yeah. Um, yeah. So if anybody else wants to just pop in and say, do you have a project in mind? Maybe you could kind of give us the gist of it um, or maybe an idea of how you could use this European Solidarity Corps to kind of supplement your existing activities with volunteers. Um, do feel free to just kind of pop in. Hi everyone. Hi. Hi there. Hi. How are you? Hi. My name is Arcadius. Uh, sorry, I, I stay quiet. You know, a lot of phone calls. I'm trying to do that many <laughs> things at the same time. That's probably everyone else. Uh, so, no worries. Uh, yeah, it is very interesting. Actually, I'm from Irish Roots Association, uh, and uh, at the moment, I'm uh, I'm acting as a national volunteer manager, and we are yeah. trying to to see where the opportunities are ahead. Hopefully, after COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, as that program starts next year, as I believe. Um, so yeah, it is. It is. A, it is something very inspirational, and uh, I see that uh, because most of our volunteers are actually not youth. Uh, so the volunteers uh, age that uh, we have over nine hundred people registered as a volunteers in IWA. Uh, it is uh, actually the mostly uh, above the age that uh, we're talking here about uh, 18 to 30. So the, uh, our volunteers are much, much um, older than that. But uh, taking into account that the future lies in the young hands, uh, I see that uh, that will be an opportunity for us maybe to 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 do something around uh, and getting the, the younger uh, generation involved. Uh, we had that uh, past experience with people coming from abroad uh, and volunteer for IWA. Uh, and as well, I see that there would maybe there will be a, a, a space for it, you know, for the next year. Uh, there is a lot of areas that the, that uh, IWA we have volunteers that are volunteering in the sports uh, sections, in uh, assistant living, in uh, uh, rock. So now our services that uh, we have locally. So yeah, I think that I think is a great, and I really thank you for that opportunity to to, to listen to this. Thank you, and I think as well I mentioned the the solidarity projects. And they can be a great way for organizations to to put their their toe in the water and to support maybe a group of young people to develop a solidarity project because the travel piece they're they're already resident in ireland the project takes place in ireland it's a part-time commitment from the the young people and um, so it can be spread out over a long period of time and it can help obviously build confidence in just the for the young people themselves to be involved in a project and for them to have been part of developing the idea for the project to be part of the process of managing that project and just to see it through to the end because I think for for some young people who may not for lots of different reasons whatever the the, the challenges they may have in their lives where the mobility part of it, so going abroad is just a step too far for them to start off with. The solidarity projects can be a great way to, I suppose, demonstrate to young people that they can be part of a bigger picture and that the things going on in their local communities, that they can develop projects where they themselves feel they're, they have a voice in how their, their local communities develop and what they look like. Um, we had great interest in them obviously in the past 18 months because a lot of people were either fearful of traveling or it just wasn't possible and young people did come together to develop solidarity projects in their local communities and I suppose as I'm saying that also in-country volunteering over the past 18 months has become much more popular so for organizations that would have usually hosted young people coming in to Ireland from European countries, a lot of them looked into, uh, into hosting young people who are already living in their communities. So bringing in the, the, that, that piece of it. So I suppose while the, the whole intercultural piece goes on, when we bring in the young people from other European countries, but bringing in someone who's living in your community into your organization as well can be a huge uh, importance to to that young person and to the organization and um, so that's we've certainly see that developed over the the past 18 months obviously with the the issues around travel um so yeah it's it's certainly and we'd love to 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 do work with uh, the irish wheelchair association as well um 
for young people to 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 volunteer and to see that happen you know and not for it to be just seeing uh organizations who work with young people who may be wheelchair users but for them to actually be involved in the program itself and to be the volunteers themselves yeah so. sure sure i completely agree and uh, yeah. you know if you look at the at the you know kind of uh, uh, the idea what the young people have about the volunteering you know the first thing is like you know i go to australia i go to africa i go yeah. to asia i spend a exactly. year there i'm gonna do something uh, good but i is it so many things that they can do over here and you know uh, on, on our Irish ground and I know how it sounds when they, when the Polish guy is saying that but uh, who is not better yeah. to say about the solidarity than me right yeah, yeah so, <laughs> so def definitely that's something that uh, we can bring on and I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to have a look uh, if we can implement it yeah I'll, I'll brilliant. Be, I'm, I'm very fine right. yeah. yeah brilliant that's great to hear I think there's um people often overlook there's so few European funding opportunities where you can actually do projects locally, you know. Yeah. So it, yeah. there's a real opportunity there, and it's a great kind of stepping your toe into the waters of it as well, and gradually really building yeah. capacity. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, so not to be overlooked. The video there, the <clears throat> the young woman who was involved in the project in the Glucksmann Art Gallery, mm -hmm. um, working with children in direct provision she's actually now just applied for another solidarity Great. project um yeah so so it's brilliant to see that and it's brilliant i think for for suzanne and i to have heard the mm -hmm. testimonies this morning from from amy and stephanie because like all of you when you're in deep in your own work you know it's you rarely mm -hmm. get a chance to lift your head up to actually see the impact of the work that you do yeah. so it's, it's great to hear that and to see that um and then to consider, you know, to, to sit and talk to organizations and consider, well, what, how could this work for you and how can we support you so that it can work for you is, is also a great, great opportunity for us. Yeah, absolutely. I just have to warn people now we're going to we're going to wrap up in a couple of minutes. So if there are any last questions, maybe stick up your hand and I can call on you if necessary. Um, but we will start just wrapping up now. Um, just by saying thank you, a big huge thank you to, to Nolene. I know Suzanne had to, had to leave, but please do pass on our thanks to her as well. Yeah, of course. Uh, to all of our panelists um, and to all of the participants today that, that tuned in to learn about it. Hopefully there is um, lots of inspiration and um, you know you, you start to think how, how can how can myself and my organization and my community benefit from uh, from this fantastic program and we've definitely seen just the impact that it has today through all of those fantastic stories and um, so with that I will as as we've mentioned throughout we will follow up by email with everything the presentations links to various events that are coming up um, the link that if you want to sign up to um, updates from Lergus or sign up to mm -hmm. updates from Access Europe as well, we provide uh, information and deadlines and updates around all European programmes, including the European Solidarity Corps, but as, along with all of the other ones as well that might be relevant to civil society groups. So it's worth signing up to it. It's free and um, it saves you potentially a lot of research <laughs> and uh, going down uh, EU funding rabbit holes. So um, we'd really encourage you to do that and we'll include all of that in our um, follow up. But you can always just feel free to reach out to us as well. Um, Suzanne and Nolene's emails were provided in the presentations there and we we'll forward them. But as well as that, you can reach out to anybody at the, on the wheels team as well. Um, and just, uh, yeah, a huge thank you. There's been some lovely comments coming in of people thanking um, the speakers and sharing uh, their kind of excitement about the programme, which is great. But we can leave it there. Anything else, Nolene, from your from Lerga's side of things, or is that OK? No, that that's absolutely fine. Just to, to say thank you and thank everyone for, for coming in this morning. And please do keep in touch. Come to our next Discovery Day or, as Emma said, contact myself or Suzanne directly and we can have a, a chat and see where we think you, you'll best fit in. But our Discovery Day is sort of your, your first step into what's next. For the quality label, if you already know you want to apply for a quality label, we run quality label hubs 
and you'll see them up on our Lyricus calendar as soon as we've the, the next set of dates set for them. So, but absolutely keep in touch with us and, and just thanks very much. And it was great to actually sit and reflect and to hear um, just to reinforce what we already know with regards to volunteering and the reciprocal impact that that has for both young people and organisations and the doors that it can open on multiple levels for organisations, as I think Vicky had pointed out, um, from, you know, just con contextualising what you do and um, building partnerships and developing your own capacity to then, I, I don't think I can say more other than what Amy has already said around the impact of volunteering on young people themselves. So yeah, just great to, to be here this morning. So. Great, absolutely, I 100%. So thank you very much, Nolene. So we leave it there, I leave it there for everybody. Um, thanks very much for joining us again and have a great day and we'll be in touch soon. So thanks a million everyone.